Hello and welcome to our program, Where God Weeps, a program in which we talk about the situation of the suffering Church around the world. Today we're going to be speaking with Archbishop John Barwa, SVD, the Archbishop of Kutak Bhubaneswar Archdiocese in the state of Orissa, in the east of India. Orissa, although a beautiful region of untouched forests, sweeping plains and mountains, is, on the other hand, one of India's most underdeveloped states. Forty percent of the population is made up of tribals and Dalits, the so-called untouchables in the Indian caste system. The Archdiocese of Kutak includes the district of Kandamahal, the scene of a series of brutal attacks against Christians that took place in August of 2008, which saw more than 100 killed and 50,000 displaced and over 4,000 homes burnt. According to reports of aid to the church in need, although chapels and parish houses are being rebuilt, Christians in Orissa continue to be targeted and harassed, and the rebuilding of the people is still continuing, as some still fear for their safety. To tell us more about the present situation in Orissa, it is my great privilege to welcome His Excellency Archbishop John Barwa. Your Excellency, thank you for being with us here today in our program. Thank you, and it is a great honor for me to be here. Your Excellency, you were in the Archdiocese at the time of the attacks in 2008 in Orissa, in which over 50,000 people were displaced, more than 100 were killed, and 170 chapels and churches were destroyed. What was your memory of this time? It was very brutal, very pathetic, and very painful. But I knew God will take care of us. You with others organized immediately protests. You, you went onto the streets, I understand, also with, with moderate Hindus, with moderate Muslims to protest the situation. Immediately in that diocese of Raurkala, we called our lay leaders. And uh, we decided that every church, convent, parish will be guarded by lay people. And hundreds every night protected, guarded the mission institutions. And we had four rallies where no matter what religion we belonged, all joined. And it was in the city of Raurkela and headed by me with my, all my Episcopal dress and thousands participated. And it was wonderful to see people of all religions. Now this violence that occurred in 2008 also affected you personally because your niece, Sister Mina Barwa, was one of the nuns that was raped and publicly humiliated. What was your reaction when you heard this? It was 25th of August when she was malhandled with that priest, uh, Father Chelan. And uh, when I heard this story, I was shocked and tried to contact through any means and talk to Sister Mina, but it was not possible. And the only night I could have a small little dialogue with her, how are you? And she just cried and cried and there was no words. So it was a shocking news for me and then I could not inform to any of my family members. But it was a very, very painful thing to accept. But at the same time, it was, then I suddenly remember, yes, for faith, maybe this is that we have to go through. And I, this leads me exactly to the next point, because Sister Mina then, I quote, she said to you on a promise, she made a promise to you on your Episcopal uh, ordination to you. She said, all my suffering, my pain and my humiliation, I offer to you for your mission as an Archbishop. How do you understand this in your vocation now? Yes, because we come from a very rural family and parents are totally uneducated and such from such family 
God chooses and uh, not only me to lead the Orissa Church of five dioceses, but much more from my family itself, Sister Mina suffers. So this for me looks as if it is totally divine plan and uh, much more when Sister Mina after, after, after suffering, she comes and tells me, Uncle, I offer my suffering for your mission. It was so empowering, so marvelous to listen to these words. And same Sister Mina tells me, I am ready even to work again for them, those who persecuted and misbehaved with me. How is she today? Today she is very fine and she continued her studies and she has done very best. And thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm. Your Excellency, uh, your ordination was also on the feast day of Our Lady of Lourdes. How do you understand this also in your vocation? To make the story short and very short, I love Mother Mary. And in my life, there were events and situations when Mother Mary, I feel in my deep down in my heart, spoke to me directly, my son, there will be difficulties and problems in your life. Take courage, I am with you. So which I believe firmly, Mother Mary loves me and Mother Mary's blessing is with me and I have total confidence. Your Excellency, we're going to take a quick moment and we're going to look back on the summer of 2008 and the events that so shocked India and the world. Sister Kiran and Sister Sarojini get ready for another long day of work. They belong to the religious order of the Society of Jesus, Mary and Joseph. Nothing can disturb them during their morning prayer, not even the lingering smell of smoke, a grim reminder of August of 2008. Back then, this Catholic education center was on fire. Fundamentalist Hindus in the state of Orissa burned down some 5,000 houses, churches, and pastoral centers belonging to the Christian minority. The violence was triggered by the murder of a prominent nationalist Hindu leader. He was killed by leftist rebels with no connection to the Christian minority whatsoever. But the nationalist Hindus took advantage of the moment to demand that all Christians should leave the country because they were considered a foreign religion with no right to exist in India. At the end of the violence, there were 70 people killed, some 50,000 displaced people and countless ruins. The pastoral center in which the two sisters live has been fixed up for now. Right after the violence, the sisters were sent here by their order to help the dislocated Christians. Sister Sarojini had just finished her education in the convent. I was telling, shall I go or not? Like that question was so many questions was within me. I do not know how to proceed this work also. And I was questioning myself. And I was praying also to God. Lord help me, I do not know the social work. I never studied for that also, like that I was questioning myself and I was praying. But anyway, it was different experience for me. Gobinda once had a nice big house, but now it all lays in ruins. We believe in God as described in the Holy Bible. We cannot worship Hindu gods. We have been raised as Christians by our parents and grandparents. In our faith, we are all considered equals and no caste system declares us as outcasts and untouchables. Because we did not convert to Hinduism, they destroyed our houses and forced us to flee from our villages. Till today, the fundamentalist Hindu advertised their politics on campaign posters like this one. The killed leader to the left, his successor on the right. Between them, the god Krishna and the famous historic military leader Arjuna, thus transferring their power to the contemporary politicians. The billboard is located in the center of the town, Rikia. Whenever the sisters come to town, they have to pass it. 
The sisters remember all too well the message that the killed Hindu leader never got tired of repeating. And being a leader, he says that you kill Christians, rape Christians, and he says let us destroy Christianity because Christianity has come from foreign and let them go to foreign to celebrate their Easter and their Christmas. The next camp they visit can be reached only on a motorcycle. It is located in the mountains of the eastern Indian state. Today, the sisters bring clothing for the men and children in the camp. For their fundamentalist Hindu neighbors, the members of the tribal people had all but one fault. They were Christians. They were expelled from their homes and camp out in this patch in the forest. Like the refugees themselves, the sisters are also members of the tribal people which are considered the lowest rank of the social fabric in India. But this is not the only reason why the two are so cordially received wherever they go. But we come and stay one day, two days, and we used to eat with them, we used to sleep with them, so they are, we are like this, we come and stay here. When I was in the convent, I used to think, oh, I have to go for a prayer. It is time for prayer. But I never need that I need prayer for my uh, spiritual life. But when we came to people and saw their faith, it is that my faith is nothing. Their faith is much more greater than our faith. And A striking example of strong faith is the family of Pramila and Godabari Pradhan. He is a day laborer and one of the untouchables. For a long time, he worked for a local Hindu farmer who promised him a good plot of land for a fair price. Godabari paid the price, but then all hell broke loose. Without blinking an eye, the neighbors watched how their little house was wrecked. When the young mother comes back to her destroyed house in the company of the two sisters, the neighbors repeat their demand. If you want to return to your place, you have to convert to Hinduism. The response of Pramila Pradhan leaves no doubt. In Christianity, there is peace and love. We want to live peacefully with all people. I do not want to give that up just because there was so much violence against us. I will remain a Christian. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to our program. I'm here with Archbishop John Barwa SVD, the Archbishop of the Kutak Bubaneswar Diocese in Orissa. And we're talking about the times today, four years after the violence in Orissa, and how Christians are trying to pick up their lives again. Your Excellency, welcome back to our program. Thank you. Thank you. Your Excellency, what is the situation today? Is it calm? Are the people afraid? Are they rebuilding their lives? Can you give us a little bit of a description about how it is today? I took charge of the diocese and I was installed as Archbishop of Katak Bhubaneswar on 2nd April 2011. After the installation, I came for Adilmina and met Pope. And on after my return to my archdiocese, I visited all my parishes, institutions, convents, met all my priests, religious and lay people. And the voice I heard from them, unanimous voice was, Archbishop, they have destroyed our property, houses, they have killed some of our beloved ones, but they could not separate us, Jesus from us, Jesus from me and my people, uh, faith. This is what so loudly proclaimed that Jesus remained with us and we remained with Jesus and situation is calm and people are saying with one voice, we are people of forgiveness, we have forgiven everything, let us build up a peaceful place, peaceful Kondamal. So it is calm, peaceful, though in the remotest area people have gone through this suffering, so there is anxiety, little worries, but more or less and in a general way it is very calm and peaceful. There is no overt manifestation of violence, but there is still ongoing intimidation and oppression by 
this small group of Hindu fundamentalists, what, first of all, what is it that they are doing? How do they oppress Christians? And, and why are they trying, to, why are they continuing to oppress and intimidate? Yeah, this happened with varieties of reasons. But I can only say immediately two reasons. One is political, other one is economic. And this area is naturally, nat naturally very rich resources. And uh, business people exploit the resources. So since these tribals and Dalits were uneducated, business people from outside would have monopoly. But when tribals and Dalits, with the missionary intervention of the great missionaries, they got educated, got into business, life came up. So this is one of the reasons. Second reason, because they are Dalits and tribals, they need, especially the Dalits who serve all others. So, because of education, their family life is coming up, their quality of life is improving, and they do not perform their traditional job of serving all other castes. Instead, they come up in life, which they do not like. So, this is one is uh, political reason, first one, second one is. Uh, Econ economic reasons. economic so if I, I want to just recap and make sure I understand this correctly then uh, the Dalits and the tribals are those that are converting most quickly to Christianity. Christianity and the economic threat is because the Dalits then and the tribals who have been educated by the Christian mission missionaries are saying wait a minute this economic interests from outside what does this mean for our lands for our heritage for our tradition the first point exactly. secondly uh, as you mentioned, of course, the Dalits are the lowest caste in the caste system and uh, the education of the Dalits then is a threat to the entire caste mm -hmm. system. This is what Father Dominic Emmanuel in his uh, this, uh, dialogue made a comment, asked the uh, wise people, edu educated mass and also people in polit political power, why this persecution taking place and the clear answer was stop working with the tribals and Dalits stop educating them and things will stop by itself they will not do any harm to anyone leave them to the hands of God they will take care of themselves and God will take care of them don't educate don't work for them that is the answer given clear answer by the politicians and the wise people educated mass are you defended by your institutions, by the government, by the police? Are Christians being defended and protected, for example, against the violence, but also against uh, this intimidation and oppression that is occurring from the fundamentalist? After me taking over the Archdiocese, I find a lot of positive signs. First of all, I am a local man and they accept me as first son of the soil as Archbishop. So all of them are Proud. You are, if I may point this out, a tribal yourself. I am a tribal myself and from Orissa, I speak the language of the state and so all the government officials and political leaders are proud that first tribal uh, local Orissa boy is the Archbishop. Hmm. So that way they are very proud and I have good rapport with political leaders, police officers and administrative bu bureaucrats. Orissa state is one of the very few states that has a religious conversions ban. And my question to you is why is there a religious conversion ban in Orissa? And secondly, the Hindu fundamentalists particularly have accused uh, that Christian missionaries have, if you will, lured uh, the tribals or the Dalits to the Christian faith through offers of materialism or, or better wealth, a better situation. Uh, what would be your answer to this? With regard to conversion, Orissa is one of the first states that implemented and enacted anti-conversion bill. And allurement is the reason that they are giving that people are converted to Christianity, which I do not agree because I myself am a tribal man and no one ever has given things that we become rich. If it was, so we would have made a huge houses, but it was the love of the missionaries. It was the concern of the missionaries. It was the dedication of the missionaries and it was the love of God. 
and their love for God made us accept this Christianity. And today I am Archbishop. If I had so much money to allure people to Christianity, I would have done many more things. I would have built my schools which are in ruined situation or I would have built houses of my tribals and Dalits which are in a miserable situation. And I am, thanks be to God, I am, gener I am very happy and grateful to generosity of many, many people like Church in India, uh, Church in the ne Church in Need and Miss You and Misery. They are the ones helping me to build up my mission and my uh, people, houses, schools and many other institutions. And if they say allurement, which is I do not agree. Suppose my social work and my developmental activities, my health care attracts people and they come to ask me for bapti baptism. What should, I, what should be my answer? And which is though we are 2.6 percentage, we are performing the activities, developmental activities and health care and education of 25 percent in India, which is accepted by everybody. If it is so, if the poor people find re uh, accepted, acceptance, respect and if they want to join me, what is wrong in accepting them to our mission fold? So, I have no difficulty in accept accepting, but since there is a law, I cannot baptize. Though many, many are asking after the persecution, more in number people want to accept Christianity and Jesus as their God and Master, but I am not able to do because of the anti-conversion bill. A person comes to you and says, Your Excellency, Your Father, I wish to be baptized. What, what do you do? You cannot baptize this person? In that context, there is, the law says only allurement is objected, which we do not. But people come with their own interest and happiness. I cannot, but at the same time law says that it has to be approved and granted permission by first class magistrate. And when our people go to meet the first class magistrate, everybody says I am not first class, I am not first class officer because they do not want to take the responsibility. We, we, this all aspect I have talked already to some of the politicians and asking them what should be our direction because people are harassed there. Nobody owns up and says that he or she is first class magistrate. So, this is one difficulty which I am requesting to change the law. And I believe and pray things will happen. You mentioned the growth of the faith, particularly after this, uh, this attacks, this persecution and this intimid intimidation. How do you see the, the faith in uh, Orissa State now? Is, is it flowering? Is it growing? When I went around my archdiocese, met the priests, religious and the people, one voice I said already was, all these difficulties could not separate us. Jesus from us and us from Jesus and it is visible by their great participation. May it be the whole day or hours of celebration, they come in thousands and they want also to show that they are not frightened and they are not at all frightened. May come whatever they will face because they love God and much more they have experienced God's love through different situations and through different people and events like church in need, miss you, all these people have helped them and vocations, numerous vocations, not just numbers, but quality. Today, that, that area has become number one in religious priestly vocation in the country and I am very proud to say this year alone I had 33 priestly ordinations, which all these events tell me loudly and tell the world loudly that we are people of faith, may come whatever, we are not frightened and God will remain with us and we will remain with God. In our earlier conversation, you mentioned that Hindus often come to Catholic events, Catholic processions with roses in their hands. Why roses and um, what is the relationship particularly to the Hindu community? Because Hindu communities go to the God, gods and goddesses for darshan and that darshan seeing God and that brings uh, favor from God and when they go they offer something beautiful and roses are the beautiful flower in the world and that is not fully flowered but the birds they offer which is so valuable and they offer it from their heart as the best gift to God 
and that what when they come to us like uh, veneration of the cross or seeing the christmas creep they come with candles they come with uh, roses bud roses and plenty of it because this is for them offering something beautiful in the world to the god Your Excellency, after all of this discussion, after all of these challenges, uh, the growth of the Christian community, the Catholic community in vocations, what are your needs? What are your specific needs that you have in your diocese? First and foremost, I thank my viewers, those who are listening to me with sincerity of heart. With the prayers, the generosity I have built up. Much of it is built up and I know your generosity has accompanied me but still long way to go i need to build up my youngsters i need to build up the strength of my people's future livelihood and all houses most of it we have built up churches institutions we have built up but in the remotest areas still we need to build up and much more the urgency is my priests during and after they were left to themselves because especially when there was persecution there was no one to organize and animate and be supportive to them and they are they are i feel somehow left to themselves i need them to be more committed dedicated and i want some of the programs that will reenergize them and i believe once my priest and religious are committed things will move by itself a lot of work to do plenty of it is but i know together will build up and i always have the song in my heart always i sing this song all the time we shall overcome some day because we are together and god is with us we shall overcome your excellency thank you for being with us here today in our program thank you for giving me this golden opportunity to share my feelings experiences god bless you thank you And thank you ladies and gentlemen for having been with us today in our program Where God Weeps. And if you would like to help Archbishop John Barwa with his projects for the rebuilding of Orissa and the support to the Christians there, I would encourage you to look at the contact information at the end of this program and we look forward to seeing you next week. Take care. <laughs>